Hey everyone, welcome to Advanced Exercise Physiology. This is chapter 21, Training for Performance. The objectives of this chapter are to 1. Design sports-specific training programs based on an analysis of the energy system utilized by the activity. 2. To define the terms overload, specificity, and reversibility. 3. To compare and contrast the use of interval training and continuous training and the improvement of the maximal aerobic power in athletes. Four, to discuss the differences between training for anaerobic power and training for the improvement of strength. Five, to discuss the advantages and disadvantages of different equipment types in weight training. Six, to define delayed onset muscle soreness and list the factors that contribute to its development. Seven, to discuss the use of static and ballistic stretching to improve flexibility. Eight, to discuss the differences between conditioning goals during one, the off season, two, the preseason conditioning, and three, in season. Nine, to list and discuss several common training errors. For those of you who are taking notes, here's an outline to categorize the major topics of this lecture. Now starting with training principles, we see that a training program should match the anaerobic and aerobic demands of the sport. We will look specifically at overload, which is increased capacity of the system in response to training above the level to which it is accustomed. There's also specificity, which refers to specific the muscles involved and the specific energy systems that are utilized. In addition, there's reversibility, which is when the training is stopped, the training effect it will be quickly lost. Here we see the aerobic and anaerobic energy systems in relation to each sport. Please review this in table 30, or excuse me, 21 in your book. Now we do want to take a quick look at the influence of gender on the initial fitness level. We see that men and women respond similarly to training programs, where exercise prescriptions should be individualized. We also see that training improvement is always greater in individuals with a lower initial fitness. So there's a 50% increase in a VO2 max in a sedentary adult, where there's only a 20 to 10% improvement in normal active subjects. And finally, you would only see a 3 to 5% improvement in trained athletes. And this may be an important difference, however, in their performance. Now if you look at the influence of genetics, we see that genetics plays an important role in how an individual responds to training. There are high responders and low responders. What you would see from Estrand and Rado is that if you want to become a world-class athlete, you must choose your parents wisely. Obviously we can't do that, but we do know that genetics plays an important role in how an individual responds to training. We also see that anaerobic capacity is more genetically determined than aerobic capacity, where training can only improve anaerobic performance to a small degree. In addition, it is dependent largely on the fast type 2x muscle fibers, which is determined early in development. In summary, the general objective of sports conditioning is to improve performance by increasing the muscle force and power by improving muscular efficiency and or improving muscular endurance. A conditioning program should allocate the appropriate amount of training time to match the aerobic and anaerobic demands of the sport. And muscles respond to training as a result of a progressive overload. When an athlete stops training, however, there is a rapid decline in fitness that occurs due to detraining, also called reversibility. And in general, men and women respond to conditioning in a similar fashion. The amount of training improvement is always greater in those individuals who are less conditioned at the onset of training, however. Now, if we look at the components of a training session, each session will start with a warm-up. This helps to increase cardiac output and blood flow to the skeletal muscles. It also increases muscle temperature and enzyme activity. In addition, it provides the opportunity for stretching exercises, which are believed to reduce the risk of muscle injury. Then there's the workout, which is the actual training session, followed by a cool down where the return blood pulled in the muscle into the central circulation. Again, the cool down functions to return the pooled blood in the muscles to the central circulation. In summary, 
Every training should consist of a warm-up period, a workout session, and a cool-down period. Although limited data exists, it is believed that a warm-up reduces the risk of muscle and or tendon injury during exercise. Now if we're looking at training to improve aerobic power, we see three different methods. One is interval training, the other is long slow distance, and the other is high intensity continuous exercise. These should all be geared toward improving the VO2 max, the lactate threshold, and running economy. If we look more closely at interval training, we see that they are repeated exercise bouts separated by brief recovery periods. The work interval can be defined by the distance to be covered, the intensity, which could be 85 to 100 percent of the heart rate max, or the duration, greater than 60 seconds, which would improve the VO2 max. There's also the opportunity to look at the rest interval, which could be light activity such as walking, and typically would be a one-to-one -one ratio of work to rest. The other thing involved in interval training is the number of interval sets and repetitions, which depends on the purpose of the training and the fitness level of the individual. Now to discuss long slow distance training, we see that it is a low intensity exercise at approximately 57% of VO2 max or 70% of the maximum heart rate. In addition, the duration should be greater than would be expected in the competition. This is based on the idea that training improvements are based on the volume of training. However, more is not always better. 1.5 hours per day of training results in a better performance than 3 hours per day. Moving on to high intensity continuous exercise, it appears to be the best method of increasing VO2 max and lactate threshold. We see that at high intensity exercise, it should be conducted at or slightly above the lactate threshold or at 90 to 100 percent of the VO2 max. You can monitor the intensity using a heart rate monitor. Here we see the relationship between training intensity and the improvement of VO2 max, where you have an optimal improvement around approximately 90 percent of the VO2 max. Table 21.2 looks at determining the intensity and the duration for training. Please reference your book for this table. Now looking at how altitude training improves exercise performance at sea level, we see, however, that altitude training may not always improve the performance at sea level, where lower training intensity at altitude may result actually in detraining. What we see that might be beneficial is to live high and train low, where you would spend time sleeping and resting at altitude, which would increase the red blood cell volume and oxygen transport capacity of blood and then you would train at a lower altitude and you would see a better performance gains compared to living and training at sea level. In, sum in summary, historically training to improve maximal aerobic power has used three methods. One, interval training. Two, long slow distance. And three, high intensity continuous exercise. Although controversy exists as to which of the training methods results in the greatest improvement of VO2 max, there is growing evidence that it is an intensity and not duration that is the most important factor in improving VO2 max. In addition, the Live High Train Low Altitude Training Program provides significant endurance performance gains compared to training and living at sea level. If we look at injuries and endurance training, we see that most injuries are the result of overtraining. There is short-term high-intensity exercise and prolonged lower-intensity exercises that can result. We want to look at the quote-unquote 10% rule for increasing our training load, where we increase intensity or duration less than 10% per week. Other injury risk factors include strength and flex flex flexibility imbalances, footwear problems, malalignment, poor running surface, and or diseases such as arthritis. In summary, the majority of training injuries are the result of overtraining, for example, overuse injuries, and can come from either short-term, high-intensity exercise or prolonged, low-intensity exercise. A useful rule of thumb for increasing the training load is the 10% rule. The 10% rule states that training intensity or duration should not be increased more than 10% per week to avoid an overtraining injury. Now, if we look at training to improve anaerobic power, we would first look at the ATP creatine phosphate system. Training this system would involve short 5 to 10 seconds high intensity work intervals. 
This would include a 30-yard dash for football players. In addition, you could look at a 30 to 60 second rest interval where little lactic acid is produced so recovery is rapid. Now if we're looking at training the glycolytic system, we would look at short 20 to 60 second high intensity work intervals, which is very demanding training and may alternate hard and light training days if you are undergoing this. In summary, training to improve anaerobic power involves a special type of interval training. In general, the intervals are of short duration and consist of high intensity exercise near maximal efforts. Now if we look specifically at strength training exercise, we can look at different types. There is isometric or static exercises where the application of force is done without joint movement. There is also dynamic or isotonic exercise that includes variable resistance exercise. In addition, something like a Nautilus equipment would be used. We can also look at isokinetic exercise where the exertion of force is at a constant speed. Now if we look at the adaptations that occur during strength training, we see that there are categories of strength training exercises like we mentioned, both isometric, dynamic, and isokinetic. But what we would see from strength training potentially is an increase in muscle mass, where there would be hypertrophy, which is increased muscle fiber diameter. And this is responsible for most of the increase in muscle size. But there's also hyperplasia, which is an actual increase in the number of muscle fibers in relation to training. Now if we look at progressive resistance exercises, we see the improvements in strength via a progressive overload, which is done periodic periodically by increasing resistance or the weight lifted to continue the overload of the muscle. This is the basis for most weight training programs. Now if we look at general strength training principles, we look at intensity, which would be looking at 8 to 12 reps. And the number of sets for maximal strength gain would involve two or greater sets that would revolt in both strength gains and hypertrophy. However, greater than 10 sets is not recommended for optimal strength gains. If we look at frequency, the recommendation would be 2 to 4 days per week or 4 to 6 days per week if using split routines. This should involve muscles used in competition, and the speed of the muscle shortening would be similar to the speed used in events. In figure or table 21.3, this goes over all the resistance training guidelines, some of which we have just covered. Now much has been talked about the periodization, and now we will discuss it in regards to strength training. This is a systematic variation of volume and intensity over time. Periodization is done to achieve optimal gains in strength, power, motor performance, and or hypertrophy over the course of a season, year, or career. There's what's called linear periodization, which is a shift from high volume to low intensity, from then to a lower volume to higher intensity training. What we see is that strength gains are greater with periodized programs. Now looking at free words versus machines, we see that strength gains are similar following training programs used by free weights and machines. Now some of the arguments for free weights are that data exists showing that free weights produce greater strength gains, that free weights produce greater movement variability and specificity, and that free weights force control of balance and stabilization. However, the disadvantages of free weights are potential for injury, proper lifting technique required, and spotters are needed. In the table 21.4, you see all the weight training equipment listed. Now if we're looking at a combined strength and endurance training program, we see that combined strength and endurance training may result in lower gains in strength than strength training alone. This depends on the training state of the subject, the volume and frequency of training, and the way the two methods are integrated. Strength and endurance training should be performed on alternate days for optimal strength gains which may be due to fatigue. Now if we look at the gender differences in response to strength training, we see that untrained males have a greater absolute strength than untrained free males, where they are 50% stronger in the upper body and 30% stronger in the lower body. However, strength related to cross-sectional area of the muscle is similar, where there is a 3 to 4 kilogram of force per centimeter squared of muscle in males and females. 
there does not appear to be a gender difference in response to short-term strength training. Men exhibit greater hypertrophy, however, as a result of long-term training due to higher testosterone levels. What we see in this graph below is a strength as a function of muscle cross-sectional area in men and women, and you can see that there's very little difference between gender. Next, we have a graph looking at training-induced strength training changes in men and women. Finally, looking at muscle soreness, and specifically the delayed onset of muscle soreness, it appears 24 to 48 hours after strenuous exercise. This is due to microscopic tears in muscle fiber or connective tissue. It results in cellular degradation and an inflammatory response. However, it is not due to lactic acid. We see that eccentric exercises cause more damage than concentric exercises and slowly begin a specific exercise over 5 to 10 training sessions to avoid a delayed onset of muscle soreness. Now some of the steps leading to delayed onset muscle soreness are strenuous muscle contractions that result in muscle damage. We also see that membrane damage occurs including the sarcoplasmic reticulum, in which case the calcium leaks out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum and collects in the mitochondria. This inhibits ATP production and activates proteases which degrade contractile proteins. This results in an inflammatory response which increases the prostaglandins and histamines. In addition, edema and histamine stimulate the pain receptors. These are now the steps leading to the delayed onset muscle soreness that we just discussed. Now if we discuss the re repeated bout effect, a bout is an unfamiliar exercise that results in delayed onset muscle soreness. Following recovery, another bout of the same exercise results in a minimal injury. Theories for the repeated bout effect are the neural theory, where the recruitment of large number of muscle fibers. There's also a connective tissue theory, which increase connective tissue to protect the muscle, or the cellular theory, which synthesis of protective proteins within the muscle fiber exists. Now again, looking at the theories to explain the repeated bout effect, which would limit delayed onset muscle soreness are listed below. In summary, Improvements of muscular strength can be achieved via progressive overload by using either isometric, isotonic, or isokinetic exercise. Isotonic or isokinetic training seems preferable to isometric exercise in developing strength gains in athletes. Since isometric strength gains occur only at specific joint angles that are held during the isometric training. Although untrained men exhibit greater absolute strength than untrained females, there do not appear to be gender differences in strength gains during short-term weight training programs. In addition, delayed onset muscle soreness is thought to occur due to microscopic tears in muscle fibers or connective tissue. This results in cellular degradation and the inflammatory response, which results in pain within 24 to 48 hours after strenuous exercise. If we look at training to improve flexibility, we see that straining exercises to improve flexibility and efficient movements are limited in evidence that the flexibility reduces the risk of injury. If we look at static stretching, this is continuously holding a stretch position. You would hold the position for 10 to 60 seconds and repeat each stretch three to five times. The preferable technique has less chance of injury or soreness and less muscle spindle activity. However, there's also dynamic stretching, which is a ballistic stretching movement. Now within flexibility training, we have a proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation, which is preceding a static stretch with some isometric contraction of the muscle being stretched. The contraction stimulates the Golgi tendon in the PNF stretch. This actually requires a training partner, but is shown to be effective. In summary, limited evidence exists to support the notion that improved joint mobility i.e. flexibility, reduces the incident of exercise-induced injury. Stretching exercises are often recommended to improve flexibility to optimize the efficiency of the movement. Improvement in flexibility can be achieved via static or dynamic stretching, with static stretching being the preferred technique. Now if we look at year-round conditioning for athletes, we have first off-season conditioning, which will prevent excessive weight gain, maintain muscular strength and endurance, 
maintain bone and ligament integrity, and maintain the skill level. You would then transition into preseason conditioning, which is 8 to 12 weeks prior to the competition. In this, you have an increase to the maximum of energy systems used in the particular sports. Following this, you would have your in-season conditioning, which is the maintenance of the fitness level achieved, and may incorporate, incorporate periodized techniques. This is an example of year-round conditioning for athletes that we just discussed. In addition, you can see the suggested activities for the various phases of the year-round training program. In summary, year-round conditioning programs for athletes include an off-season program, a pre-season program, and an in-season program. The general objectives of an off-season conditioning program are to prevent excess excessive fat weight gain, maintain muscular strength and endurance, maintain bone and ligament strength, and preserve their reasonable skill level in the athlete's specific sport. Now looking at common training mistakes, we first see overtraining, with workouts that are too long or too strenuous, and this is a far greater problem than undertraining. However, undertraining is also a common mistake. In addition, you can perform nonspecific exercises, which do not enhance the energy capabilities used in competition. Also, there's a failure to schedule a long-term training plan, and there's a misuse of training time as a result. In addition, there's a failure to taper before performance, with inadequate rest which compromises performance. Some of the symptoms we see in overtraining are an elevated heart rate and blood lactate levels at the same submaximal work rate, a loss in body weight due to reduction in appetite, chronic fatigue, psychological staleness, multiple colds and sore throats, as well as a decrease in performance. The diagram below lists and shows all the common symptoms of overtraining that we just discussed. Now referring to tapering, this is a short-term reduction in training load prior to competition. It allows the muscles to resynthesize glycogen and heal from training-induced damage. It tends to improve performance in both strength and endurance events, where athletes can reduce training load by 60% without a reduction in performance. In summary, common mistakes in training include undertraining, overtraining, performing nonspecific exercises during training session, failure to carefully schedule a long-term training plan, and a failure to taper prior to competition. Symptoms for overtraining include 1. an elevated heart rate and blood lactate levels, at a fixed submaximal work rate, two, a loss in body weight due to a reduction in appetite, three, chronic fatigue, four, psychological staleness, five, an increased number of infections, and or six, a decrease in performance. In addition, tapering is the term applied to short-term reduction in training load prior to competition. Research has shown that tapering prior to competition is useful in improving performance in both strength and endurance events. That concludes the content for chapter 21. Here is a series of study questions to test your knowledge and to help you better understand the chapter. 1. Explain how knowledge of the energy systems used in a particular activity or sport might be useful in designing a sport-specific training program. 2. Provide an outline of the general principles of designing a training program for the following sports. 1. Football, 2. Soccer, 3. Basketball, 4. Volleyball, 5 distance running at approximately 5,000 meters, and 6 a 200 meter dash. 3. Define the following terms as they relate to interval training. 1. Work interval. 2. Rest interval. 3. Work to rest ratio. And 4. A set. 4. How can interval training be used to improve both aerobic and anaerobic power? 5. List and discuss the three most common types of training programs used to improve VO2 max. Then, discuss the practical and theoretical differences between an interval training program used to improve the ATP phosphocreatine system and a program designed to improve the lactic acid system. 8. List the general principles of strength development. 9. Define the term isometric, isotonic, dynamic, and isokinetic. 10. Outline the model to explain the delayed onset muscle soreness provo proposed by Armstrong. 11. Discuss the use of static and dynamic stretching to improve flexibility. Why is a high degree of flexibility not desired in all sports? 11. List and discuss the objective of 1. Off-season conditioning, 2. Pre-season conditioning, and 3. In-season conditioning. 
And finally, 12, what are some of the more common errors made in the training of athletes? This concludes Chapter 21, which is the topic of training for performance. Please reference this lecture and or your textbook for further information and to answer questions. In addition, feel free to email me at any time. Thanks.